I guess uh, I'll start now. Um, hello, everybody. Um, I'm Aditya. I work at Samsung Austin R&D Center. Uh, I work on compilers. Um, my colleague Sebastian, he could, he could not come here, so I'll be presenting the whole thing, basically. Um, this presentation is about uh, performance analysis of uh, this one. Is this not working? I don't know. OK. So um, I work on um, compilers most of the time. But uh, recently, like for the last one year, I started working on the C++ standard library, uh, libc++ most of the time, and lib standard C++ uh, when I get some free time. Um, why I started this work? Because um, we, we mostly support Android. And what happens is Android uses uh, LLVM. They, they switched to LLVM recently. And what happened was uh, we have to the, the target is to the goal is to improve Android performance basically. Now you can do compiler optimizations, but what happens is um, if you if you have worked with a compiler guy or you are uh, you are familiar with compiler optimizations, what happens is if you enable or disable few optimizations, uh, maximum you are going to get like five ten percent things like that unless you are disabling vectorizer or something. But uh, when we started looking at the code of uh, standard library, we found that there are a few places where the things are not very optimal. And uh, if, you if you improve those algorithms, the performance of like few benchmark or few pieces of code which exercise those uh, functions will improve drastically. Why? Because we are just changing the algorithm instead of uh, teaching compiler to optimize those functions for small redundancies. So that is how I started getting more and more interested here. So I'll just directly dive into the code and show what are the things we did and how performance improved. Most of the optimizations we did was uh, very simple, but uh, I'll show the performance numbers, and um, that will show that how much impact you can have when you just change few lines of code in the standard library. So um, this is the uh, first function which caught our attention. This function is xsgetn. If you guys are not familiar with that, whenever you read a file using iostream, this is the function, this is the leaf function which is going to get called. So if this function is not optimal, your file read is going to be slow. Now, um, my uh, PowerPoint skills are not great, so um, that's how it looks not, yeah, that is how it looks. So um, I've highlighted two lines of code here, where basically what it, this function does is, as long as you have uh, enough character to copy from one buffer to the other, when you're reading a file, you're copying the contents of a file to another buffer, for example. This is what it does. As long as you're not at the end, you keep copying from one buffer to the other, right? The problem here is it checks for the end marker each time it copies one character, which is not very optimal, because you're kind of, you already know how far you have to copy. And the, there is no much point in checking all the time for each character, because you already know that I have to copy 100 characters. You don't have to check each time that you're at the 100th character or not. So uh, this was a very simple um, improvement, because we work on compilers, so we just when we see the code, we just really uh, know very easily that what's going on. The, so what we did was, OK, you just check for the bounds uh, in the beginning, and you, uh, uh, you find out that what is the safest number of characters you can copy. And you don't have to copy directly. You just call traits type copy. And traits type copy for a character array will co uh, convert to mem copy, and mem copy is already very efficient, so we don't have to do anything uh, fancy here, and you increase the bound basically, the induction variable. So, just few lines of code, right? And uh, the performance numbers. Um, this is a very synthetic benchmark to show uh, what the performance uh, improvements were, because I cannot share the uh, the exact code. Um, so uh, I used valgrind to just uh, show that the number of instruction counts decreased, basically. It decreased by like only 20,000, which is not great. But uh, in the real benchmark, it improved by like more than 10%. Also, whenever you're uh, doing any stuff, like you're reading file all the time, most, uh, it's a very common thing. So number of um, cycles will reduce drastically if whenever you're reading file, if you use the optimized algorithm. Okay. So this was the first one. And we, when we started doing that, we so, thought, OK, there might be more opportunities, basically. So the next function which caught our attention was string find. And um, I guess 
it'll be really hard to find someone who has not used string find, right? String find in libc++ uses um, the std find, basically, um, which is the generic find algorithm. Now, string find means uh, you find for a substring in a bigger string, like the needle and a haystack kind of thing. Now, um, this, uh, this is the algorithm std underscore underscore search, which is uh, std find for, uh, from a library point of view, the, from the interface point of view. So the first part of uh, function says that give, give me the first matching character of the substring. And the next part says, now, I'll, uh, now I have already found the first matching character. Just compare the uh, substring with the remaining characters, if, it is, if there is a match or not. And if there is a match, then you're done. If, you're not, if there is no match, then you reiterate and find the next matching character, basically. So this is also a very simple algorithm. I guess anyone can write this one. Now, what, it, what we did was, the first part says that first, give me the first matching character. And there is already a function which gives you the first matching character, which is called traits type colon colon find, which will give you the first matching character. The second part says, match the uh, string. So you just call traits type colon colon compare, right? Mm -hmm. So the algorithm becomes much simpler and easier to understand now. And it, this function, uh, this uh, change is, makes the algorithm like extremely fast. Uh, I'll show you the numbers in a bit. Now, um, the last line I've said that you can use Boyer mode here as well. If you're familiar with uh, like uh, some um, more optimal string find algorithms, then you can use Boyer mode if you don't find a match, then how much you have to bump. But I've not used that one. I've just only changed few lines of code, made it easier to read as well. And the performance numbers are, means it, this is too surprising to be believable also. But the, the improvement is like more than 10x in the worst case. So um, uh, this is for a synthetic test case. Means in the real world, you, you, you can have a different performance numbers. So you can regress also in few cases. I'm not saying that you'll always improve. But this is like one of the best numbers you can. You can. You're improving like 10, 10x in some cases. Okay. There's a question over here. Sure. What, was the, what was the source of the performance improvement there? Is it just calling the traits? Uh, because oh yeah, sorry. I um, so the question is uh, what was the source of performance improvement here? I forgot to mention. Traits type colon colon find is calling memchr. Memchr is hand optimized assembly in the libc. Okay. And traits type colon colon compare is mem compare, which is already also very optimized. Okay. There are, all, there are other improvements which can, can be done. Like for a small string, you are uh, incurring a cost of a call. So uh, it'll be good to, means I've not done that part. So if the size of the substring is very small, you can just do a for loop here. No need to make a call because call is also expensive. Similarly for mem compare, you can do the comparison if the size of a string is very small. Okay. So um, this is, these are the two. Um, so the numbers you are seeing here, um, like 10x or something, because the substring I'm searching for is also big. So that exploits the like, best case scenario for my changes. So uh, you don't have to just believe that it will always be 10x. So it might be uh, not 10x all, in all the cases. OK. All right. <coughs> so um, other few op like micro optimizations, basically. We did for uh, string routine in libc++ LIPC++ was, the first one was inlining the constructor. Um, so basic string underscore underscore init, this is, uh, this is called by the constructor. So the constructor basically, it dispatches to underscore underscore init. And that is where all the hard work happens. So this function was not inlined by default. And um, if you don't inline the constructor of a string, uh, the string heavy computation are going to be slow. So uh, we inlined, uh, just, it was a very simple fix. You just add inline keyword and you're kind of done. Similarly, for the basic string uh, destructor, that was also not getting inline, and um, we added inline keyword. And this was a simple optimization, but it also gave us some improvements. Now, uh, um, if you are from a compiler background, like if you work on compiler optimizer, you can say that why the inliner did not work. I mean, sorry? Uh, did you measure the, the changes in size after doing all that inlining? No, I have not. So the question was, uh, have I measured the code size after um, inlining the functions? I have not measured, sorry. Um, so in the compiler backend, you already have inliner, uh, inlining optimization going on. So what, why would you even need inline keyword here? Um, the problem is, this basic string is an external template. Okay? 
and external templates uh, are uh, in the standard library, they are initialized like, uh, um, I don't know, what is the right word? But uh, you force initialize the external template for basic string char in lib standard C++ or lib C++. So kind of the Clang front end or GCC front end, they know that this function is already explicitly initialized somewhere. So it will not even bother generating those functions in your translation unit, OK? So the optimizer will not even see it, so it will not even inline it. So that was the problem. But adding inline keyword, I guess there's some standardies, I don't know. But adding inline keyword will uh, force the compiler to generate the inline, the function definition in the translation unit. So then the optimizer can inline that thing. Because inline is not like, inline is a suggestion kind of thing, right? Okay. Okay. Few other optimizations. Um, so there were missing attributes on the many of the uh, like standard container or like throw functions which are going to throw, which are non-returning. So if you are going to call this function, that means your program is going to abort basically. Uh, this attribute no return was missing from them, and uh, this attribute actually helps the compiler optimizer because. When you add this attribute, the compiler knows that this is a very less likely path. So when scheduling the basic blocks of, um, in a function, it will put the less, less likely path in a, in, a, in a place which is like farther. And it will, you know, to in, increase the locality of reference, it will put the more likely path uh, nearby. Okay. So that is how compiler optimizer can get help from attribute no return. So um, when you have assert zero or things like that, they are basically no returning function. So also, uh, so there were a bunch of like almost like several of the uh, standard containers which were missing this attribute. So we added uh, this attribute on all of them. Um, the other benefit of this attribute no return is in static analyzer because it can avoid many false positives if you add attribute no return on non-returning functions. So um, um, it's easy to verify if you go to Clang static analyzer documentation, they have the detailed um, guideline and how to uh, use this attribute to your advantage. It'll reduce many false positive because on a non-returning path, uh, if, if there's a memory leak or things like that, you probably don't care about that part. So it'll, give, it'll reduce false positives like there was a memory leak in your path and uh, remove a bunch of noise in your static analysis experience, okay? So um, this is just one example. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Now, um, this is the latest one I was working on. Um, when you uh, parsing numbers in the, when you use a uh, string stream library, basically, mm -hmm. and you start reading uh, numbers or like a data structure from um, using the string stream library, okay. What happens is um, when you're parsing numbers, for each character uh, you parse, or each, each number you are parsing, the libc++ will allocate a string to hold onto that uh, number, like a potential number maybe, okay? What happens is um, this uh, using std string is completely unnecessary in that case. You can use a character buffer, which will avoid uh, some of the allocations uh, problem with the uh, std string. And the other thing what it does is it calls std string resize. Resize is like a, it's a bad function in my opinion because it calls memset to initialize the memory for you. So if you want to reserve, probably you should call reserve rather than resize, okay? Because if you're calling resize, means you're going to use that buffer somehow, so probably you're going to initialize it later as well. So no need to reinitialize multiple times. The next problem with um, number parsing is there's a template string which will match. It's going to match that, okay, is the number valid or not? Like, so you have zero, one, two, three. These are the possible digits, valid digits for a decimal number, right? Now, if you see the plus and minus are at the end, like very near the end. So parsing number minus 10 is significantly slower than parsing like 10, okay? It has to go to the end to find there is a valid minus sign, okay? So these are the problems. And the final problem is it makes unnecessary copy of this template string, which is not necessary in the common case. Common case being, if you are just parsing characters, if you are not parsing W string, for example, like WHR. So for WHR, they have to do some widening um, things which are required by the standard, I guess, I don't know. 
But for the common case, we are parsing characters. There is no need to copy this uh, buffer. So um, the idea was to opt, uh, just remove that part. Okay. So the solution, like there is one solution which I have proposed right now, which, to, which will avoid the copying of this um, buffer, uh, the atoms buffer, and that gives like uh, almost 11 percent of improvement in like one of my synthetic test cases. Okay. This this patch is still up for review, so it has not been uh, approved yet. Okay. Um, the other problem is you cannot just make this change because of the ABI incompatibilities. So you have to version the change for future library um, um, like releases. So the current, uh, if you use libc++ currently, even if you if, even if the patch is approved, you're probably not gonna, going to get this uh, advantage. Okay. So these are the, like three or four optimizations that we did. Now um, this started. Um, I started getting more interested in this part. Um, I'm mostly a compiler guy, so I will write backend optimizations in my like usual time. But um, and then I started thinking that there might be more opportunities of imp uh, improvement, right? So the idea was to do a systematic analysis of standard libraries. So libc++, libstandard c++, and uh, like Microsoft Visual Studio library, c++ library, basically. So how would you do that? Um, I started searching on like internet, and there are blogs that okay, vector is better than list, and map is better than hash map, or vice versa, blah blah blah. But there is no systematic uh, analysis available. So like one person on one blog is expert on one data structure or one algorithm, kind of like that, which is not very useful for uh, like a widely used library like libc++ or libstandard c++. So um, then I started writing th uh, this benchmark. This um, I named it as a steady benchmark. Um, um, currently, this is like a work in progress. So, this is like um, basically a fancy way of saying that it, it might have bugs. Yeah, um, it builds on Windows, Linux. It builds on Windows because I'm not an expert in Visual Studio, but thanks to CMake, it just works somehow. And Performance numbers are very stable because of um, because I'm using Google Benchmark. If you guys are familiar with Google Benchmark, it's a micro benchmarking library, which does all the hard work for you for stabilizing and things like that. It'll, um, I just I'm interested in like what is the final number basically. Okay, so this is the first problem. I mean, when I started writing Benchmark and then I started doing systematic analysis, like comparing libraries. So the first problem I found was this one. A steady sort. So the standard requires that the steady sort should have worst case of n log n. Okay. Now lib standard C++ has this uh, satisfies this requirement. Um, lib C++ uh, currently does not. So there is one opportunity of improvement. That's what I'm saying. But uh, lib C++ uses quick sort, like the vanilla quick sort with some tweaks. Okay. So there is a um, there is a synthetic test case which will exploit exploit the worst case of uh, quick sort. It is a very famous uh, uh, test case pattern. If you have that kind of pattern, uh, quicksort will uh, turn into an O of n square because, as we all know, that quicksort is worst case O of n square. Okay, but an average case it is n log n. So I tested for average case as well, and average case it is all fine. So average case means you used a uniform uh, in distribution kind of. You have a uniform distribution of random integers and. In that case, it will sort just fine. It's kind of equal to lib standard C++ sort algorithm. Um, just wanted to mention that the compiler I'm using is like very latest, like February, March time frame, GCC as well as Clang. And Visual Studio, uh, I'll be showing results for Visual Studio as well. Uh, the compiler I'm using is Visual Studio 2000, no, Visual Studio 15, 2017. That is the version. Yeah. I don't know. They put two numbers in one. Uh, yeah, that's weird. Okay. So um, the second problem was so string find. I've already discussed about the optimizations we did. So this is the result from string find for uh, all the three libraries. Um, so the green color is Visual Studio, and the blue and red ones are um, libc++ lib C++ and um, sorry, blue and the red ones are libc++ and libc++ libstandard c++. 
if, uh, as you can see, both the libc++ and libstandardc++ have uh, kind of the same performance because I have put the same patch in both the compiler, both the libraries. So they will perform exactly the same. Okay. Now, um, these are four different test cases to exploit extreme cases. So please don't take this result like for granted that this is always true. Uh, in my experience, when you do an experiment, that experiment is true only for one data set for one uh, environment. Okay. So if you are just, please don't assume that this is always worse or this is always better. You can do your own experiment. And that is the reason I started developing STD benchmark. Because uh, just randomly saying one is better than another is not useful. And that also depends on the framework or, and platform as well. So, so the test case is no match. All, no match means there is no match. So you, if you, even if you go until then, you're not going to find a match. These are all synthetic test cases. So for no match, if you see, uh, Visual Studio is like performing very worse because they are using some fancy algorithm, basically. In the, for libc++ or libstandard c++, what I'm doing is, if you can see the implementation, this one, right? It's the first one, the first part says, give me the first matching character, and which is memchr. It's going to go at like blazing fast speed and say, okay, I did not find a match. It's like at least four times or like maybe eight times faster, depending on your vector unit on your hardware, okay? So it's not like a linear find, it's like sublinear find algorithm. Okay, and the other ones are like all match means you're going to find the match in the first place as well. So both libraries will perform kind of similar and match one, match two are like first, uh, like in, uh, you find the match in between the string or third quarter of the string. These are basically synthetic test cases, but this uh, shows uh, some important uh, variations, okay? Now, um, obviously the next thing to do will, will be to compare with the Stir stir because stir stir uh, on libs libsy uses Boyer Moore algorithm, and Boyer Moore is a is a like a very optimal string find algorithm, and not only it tries to find the matching character, but when you find when there is a mismatch, it knows how to how much characters to skip, so it builds a, some kind of a small state machine to uh, jump over those characters in a very efficient way. Okay, now. The problem with that one is, if you have a smaller string, substring to compare, um, by the time you are done building the state machine, other algorithms will be done, kind of, okay? For example, <coughs> memchr. Memchr will, be, will say, okay, I've, I've not found anything, while stir stir is still trying to build the state machine, okay? The other problem is, stir stir is written for libc, so it does not even know the bounds, so it has to go until the end to find something to get the bounds as well. So it will spend a lot of useless time, okay? So um, this is the behavior for um, basically no match, all match, match one, match two. These are four um, like uh, extreme cases, okay? The fifth one, which is called multiple matches, means there is a bigger string uh, which has multiple prefixes which will match the smaller string. So in that case, the implementation we did will not perform very well as compared to Boyer Moore because Boyer Moore already knows how much to skip or where to go. But in the in the libc++, the current uh, patch we did, it will say, okay, give me the first matching character. Oh, I failed. Give me the, uh, it will make another call to memchr, give me the next matching character. And the cost of call will take over the cost of, um, uh, by the time you're finding, you are you have incurred already too many calls, okay? So that is like, um, a bad situation for the current implementation. So um, I guess the idea is to, if you inline the uh, memchr or, and memcompare, probably it will be much faster. And um, in my experience in real world, the substring is probably smaller. So what happens is for a smaller substring, you want, really want to have a simple algorithm like we did rather than uh, doing boy more, okay? Okay. This is, this is like a traditional war between two data structures, like vector versus deck in this case. I'm not putting list here because that is not very useful. So um, this is the graph which shows pushback on vector versus uh, deck. And if you see the performance, they are not very far from each other, okay? So it's, deck is not like an extremely bad data structure. It, it is useful in some cases. Especially in pushback, if you see, Deck is actually better because for vector it has to allocate more and more memory. And for n elements, 
it can potentially allocate two and uh, memory allocations, okay, and it will result in some memory fragmentation also. So if you are just doing pushback, means you're just writing elements, deck will be uh, efficient in many cases, okay. Um, in all these graphs, sorry. Have you looked at different um, factors for like inside the vector every time? Because I think the C++ uses time scale. Yes. But I think it's known that times 1.5 is, is way better. Yeah, 1.5 is used by, uh, I guess, uh, Visual Studio, I guess, or, um, yeah, yeah, I guess Visual Studio uses 1.5. No, I have not used that one. There's a logic behind that, okay, 1.5 will uh, work, but uh, I have not tried that one. Okay, in all these graphs, lower is better. So, like the blue line for uh, deck for GCC is better than other red ones, basically, okay. Now, um, for accesses, when you're reading elements, you would expect vectors should be faster, and which is here. Vector for GCC as well as Clang has the same performance, uh, which is far better than uh, DEC, like for Clang and GCC as well. But a little bit, um, Clang means, when I say Clang or LLVM, uh, in this context, please assume libc++. Um, so um, there's a little bit of performance difference between uh, DEC of GCC, uh, GCC and uh, Clang. Um, so this also shows one like area of improvement, okay? And so these are the results when you get when you do a systematic analysis, when you compare things and then you find a difference, okay? Okay, so the idea is um, in real world, you're not just writing elements or you're not just reading elements. Probably you're doing both things, right? Just reading from somewhere, that means it's already there. Or you, if you just write, that means you just cannot do dead writes, right? You're going to use that somehow later. So this is just one experiment. It's, it, it is just showing one aspect where uh, reads and writes are equal, okay? Number of, you, have, you push back n elements and you read n elements in sequence. So reading in sequence means you're giving maximum advantage to vector, okay? In this case also, you, you can see that, so I've added the time of both the previous slides, basically. So you see the performance difference are not like too far from each other. So which shows that there is all, there's a sweet spot where deck will be better than vector, okay? And what is that sweet spot when number of reads are far less than number of writes? Because for writes, vector is uh, less efficient than deck. And on, for reads, vector is much more efficient. So you have to carefully choose your data structure based on the size of memory you're trying to use. So yeah. When you, when you say writes, um, I, are you meaning insertions? Pushback, only pushback, yeah. yeah not so appends, not rather than writing. Yeah, yeah. Not writing, writing existing elements. Okay. Yeah. Good. Yeah. So Marshall's comment was, um, when I'm I, I'm use, saying writes, that means push back, like um, it's kind of append on the back. Okay. Not like um, insertion in between. So I'm giving maximum advantage to both the data structures here. So, yeah. Okay. So um, this is another test case which shows um, performance difference between. Associative containers versus hashed associative means set, map, unordered set, and unordered map. Okay, you can see uh, LLVM and sorry, Clang and GCC. They are almost have the same performance behavior for all the four data structures, whereas Visual Studio is like uh, all over the place for set and map. So the first one is set, the second one is unordered set, and the third one is map, and the fourth one is unordered map. So for unordered set and unordered map, Visual Studio is better, especially when the data size is bigger. But for set and map, which are um, kind of B tree, uh, Visual Studio is uh, is not doing great here. Okay. And the test, sorry. Have you looked into why MSPC's implementation is better for unordered? Uh... No. So the question is, have I looked at the implementation of um, the impl uh, of this uh, in Visual Studio? So I have not looked at implementation of any of these. That's why I'm just showing the experimental results. So this is a motivation for me, or if you, anyone is interested here, to go and uh, do some useful work, basically. <laughs> yeah. Did you run the checks on 32 or 64 bits? Um, so the question is, um, did I run on 32 or 64 bits? I ran on 64 bits, so um, I should have mentioned before. The hashing algorithm is, so 64 bits just means they may have a worse performance than on 32 bits. It is quite possible, yeah. So that's why I said, for the experimental results, please uh, don't assume that this is always the case. This is true for one data structure and one data set for one uh, platform, okay? Yeah. What were your key and value types? Both are integers. So the key and value types are integers in both the case, okay? Yeah. Okay. 
this is an interesting uh, example. Um, on the left hand side, this is basically a mem copy, if, uh, like a poor man's mem copy. You have a two buffer, you assign from one buffer to the other, while both, uh, and for like n elements, for example. While you are not at the end, you just keep assigning. So on the left hand side, a programmer which has no, who has no idea about um, compiler optimizations or any fancy thing, who is going to write the left hand side algorithm, right? On the right hand side, people who have like little bit of more idea, okay, I'll add its restrict keyword and the compiler will convert this to mem, mem copy. And so that guy is going to write the right side. And people who are extremely smart, they're going to call just mem copy. They're not going to do any of these, right? Now the performance number says, uh, tells you kind of a different story because this is for 32 kilobyte of data size. So the behavior can change based on the data size also. So please only assume that this is true for only 32 kilobyte. For GCC and Clang, the left hand side algorithm is much better. For the right hand side algorithm, when, the, when, the, when you add restrict keyword, what happens is Clang does not convert this to mem copy, while GCC does. So GCC is trying to be extra smart, but it loses performance. Why? Because now you are incurring a call, things like that. So it can be, the performance can, number can differ when you change the data size. So if you're like copying one megabyte probably, the mem, mem copy version will uh, beat this, uh, the vanilla version by a huge margin, okay? The third one is mem copy. So unless you can, uh, mem copy is going to be, in this case, it is like 30% slower, okay? Now, uh, Visual Studio for some reason, it's like 11 times slower, I don't know why. This is, this is not even believable, but that is the number I got. Yeah, so I'm using O2 optimization for Visual Studio. And on the manual, they say that if you use O2, that is the for best performance. So I have used that one. So I'm not any, I don't have a lot of experience with Visual Studio, so I just used O2. Okay. Um, even for all these, uh, uh, like GCC and Clang, I'm using O3. No other extra flag, okay? Because uh, that is what the end user is going to use. Uh, if I tweak the flags, I can get different numbers, but that is not what my goal is here. Okay. Now, um, that was, uh, uh, what work I did, what the experiments I did. Uh, now I'm going to um, show some of the like, useful lessons I learned. Maybe it is useful for uh, you guys as well. First one is um, STD, uh, regarding STD Rotate. Um, I'm going to ask one question. How many of you guys have seen uh, Sean Parent's lecture and learned STD Rotate from that one specifically? Okay, so I'm in the same crowd. I also learned STD Rotate from there, uh, that same talk. One was given at A9 and the other one is a CPP, sorry, CPP now, CPP con, sorry. Um, and if you read, uh, Alexander Stepanov has, uh, uh, on his website, he has notes on programming and he shows how to write std rooted for different, three different kinds of iterators, like forward, uh, bidirectional, and uh, random access iterators. All the three have three different algorithms and all of them are like, extremely fancy and you will really like the algorithm, okay? Now the problem is, um, when you are using bi-directional iterators, most of the time you are probably working on a linked list kind of thing, okay? If you are not, then this is not true for you, but if, um, if you are using a bi-directional iterator, if it is a linked list, you don't want to use that fancy algorithm because it is going to give you extremely slow performance. Why? Because the time complexity of std rotate is three of n, kind of, or O of n, you can say. But for std list, we know that it is a uh, doubly linked list. You don't even have to make any copies. Like those copies are completely useless. You just detach the list and move it on the other direction. That's it, right? So no copy, extremely efficient std rotate, okay? So you get the functionality of std rotate, but you don't even use that uh, fancy algorithm, okay? The second observation is std find may not always be the right choice. As we saw, uh, std find is a linear search algorithm, right? You go from one element to the other one. But for fundamental data structures like characters or integers, you can go in sublinear time. Like you can vectorize that uh, your algorithm, and you can go four times faster or like eight times faster, depending on your, the size of data set and the vector factor of your hardware. Okay. So um, these are. I've learned many other lessons, but for this, the crowd like of elite people, I'm sharing. I thought maybe useful for other people as well. Okay. So the first one was for uh, regarding the algorithms. This is for containers. Like, what is the 
what was my observation? You should consider total cost of data using a data structure, not like just reads or writes. You should see how many reads are, are you doing and total how many writes you are doing. If the reads are much less than writes, probably deck is a better choice than vector. You are you will gain uh, you will not lose memory like vector will do a memory fragmentation in a very bad way. Okay. Um, so that is my observation. You have to take like a, ra a ratio of reads to writes and measure. Basically, unless you measure, there is no uh, like right answer. Okay. Um, the other problem with um, most of the STL like deck list or vector, they have this resize uh, function. Okay. You can call string resize, vector resize. Resize will not only allocate the memory for you; it is going to initialize, like call the default constructor or something like that, on each of the elements. That is just uh, in my opinion, it's almost always useless unless you're doing a very special case. So consider um, using, not using resize, okay? Uh, you can use reserve, I guess reserve is okay, but not, resize is not a very useful thing to do. But people, off, um, on Stack Overflow also, and there are other places I've seen that people confuse resize with reserve. They are not the same. Another one for containers is std string. So as I mentioned earlier, if you do string resize, it is going to allocate that uh, enough space for enough characters, and it is going to call memset, or kind of initializing the memory. Maybe that is not a very useful thing in your case. So you, you should consider using that one, not using resize. Okay. Uh, the second observation is the destructor of std string is very difficult to optimize away. Why? Um, I'm going to show you an example, which is surprising and I don't know, funny as well. Why? So you have two test cases. In both the cases, from a high level point of view, from a programmer point of view, the string can be just deleted. It's not, it is not doing anything useful, okay? In the first case, you, you have a string which has one character A, and you append to a string another character, okay? And that's it. So it just can be deleted completely. So when you compile with GCC, G++ minus O3, F no exception. F no exception because STL data structure can throw exceptions, so I just, want to give them maximum opportunity for optimization, okay? So that's why I've used that one. And std is equals C++11, okay, who knows? People say compiling with C++11 is going to give you some good benefits, so I've used that one as well. I'm just trying to give them maximum advantage, okay? I'm grappling for that funny uh, letter, that is the destructor of, um, that is a destructor basically, okay? So GCC is going to, GCC optimizes away completely, while Clang does not. Also for Clang, um, oh, I missed the flag. There is a flag uh, minus stdlib equals libc++. I've used that one, so I've not mentioned here. Uh, probably because of lack of space. So. so Clang does not optimize that one. Okay, that is fine. In the second case, you have a string. I, you just allocate a string, const string. Nothing is going to happen to that one. You just call a foo function, which does not do anything, and you return. That's it. So that can be deleted as well. In this case, GCC does not optimize that one, but Clang does. Um, yeah, so you can see that problem here, right? So one compiler does one thing, one right thing, in, but the other compiler does not do in other case, basically. Okay. So the question is, why uh, the destructor of uh, std string is so difficult to optimize? The problem is they use um, small string optimization. Um, yeah. So. Um, when you do strong, small string optimization in the destructor, they try to find out that am I a longer string or a short string? If I'm a long string, I have to do a deallocation on heap. Otherwise, I just have to do nothing. And that check, at, it is difficult to uh, do uh, optimization by compilers. In, so as you see, in one case, the compiler does. In other case, it does not, right? So that is the problem there. OK. Lessons learned for language library. This is a gray area. If you don't agree with me, that's perfectly fine. Um, the first one is, in C++, the constructor and destructor of uh, data structure, uh, or a class, cannot be const qualified, okay? And um, I think this is a problem. This also, I guess, uh, shows a hole in the type system of C++, because the data structure does not itself know that I'm a const. I guess, semantically, that's what I'm trying to say here. If you see the previous example, const std string, right? If string knew that I'm a const, there was nothing to be done. It should have been just optimized away by front end, maybe, OK? There might be many, many corner cases. Uh, I don't know, but uh, I'm not a C++ expert either. So I'm just uh, showing the problem here, OK? 
And um, luckily, I tried to search this on web, and I found that there, in 1995, there was a guy, Kevlin Henney, and he proposed this thing, and it just died. The second problem, as I showed for STD Rotate, there is that iterator-based algorithms, right? They have a huge problem that they, they lose information. Losing information means iterator is just a pointer. So it does not know the sequence or the range it is pointing to. So in, a, in essence, when you pass begin and end pointer to an STD al standard algorithms, they don't know where they are pointing to. So they, they, are lo they have lost a lot of useful information. And in some cases, it is going to be suboptimal, as I showed in the case of STD Rotate. If, if the STD Rotate knew that I'm a list, I can just do exchange of pointers. It's, it's not an easy problem, because if you're trying to design a uniform interface, you probably want an iterator. I don't know, but if you know that, uh, you probably don't have to use STD Rotate all the time. You can use your own uh, algorithm. Okay. Um, the third observation is for character arrays, right? Like string, you have mem set, mem copy, mem compare, many fancy things. But for other data types, fundamental data types like integer, there is nothing like that. Like there is no mem compare which takes an integer. There is no mem set for integers. So if you do mem set, you can only set like a variable which is like a character, unsigned character basically, which is not like um, very optimal. So you have to write your own fancy algorithm to do a mem set, which is, which can do like much more heavy duty, uh, optimized mem set for you. And in fact, many um, libraries do that, but that there is no standard facility for that. I think this is a huge limitation. Um, the fourth observation is, um, while I was at BoostCon, it, this is like sixth day, I guess. Uh, several times I've heard that. Uh, Unsigned integers are not good. I, I was also convinced that unsigned integers are not good because they wrap around and prevent many useful compiler optimizations. Um, I guess for now, now it is okay to use that because I have seen and I've verified as well. GCC will vectorize a loop if the induction variable is unsigned. Okay. Um, I have pointed out the bug, up, the bugzilla as well. If you are not convinced, you can go and check out. So using unsigned uh, for like vector or your data structure as an induction variable, it will not harm your uh, vectorization. So I guess it is okay to use unsigned. Yes? Can you uh, go more into that? Is, is there a specific way you suggest to use an induction variable? Why is it um, doesn't optimize better in that case? So the argument was, uh, so the question is I have to explain more that why, it, uh, why the compiler was not optimizing before or why this argument even came up in the first place. Uh, the problem is unsigned uh, integers have a um, defined wraparound semantics. So if you go over the bound, uh, it basically wraps around. And the compiler tends to get confused that, okay, is the bound from begin to end in a uh, monotonically increasing fashion or is going to the other way around? Okay. And that confuses compiler. That used to confuse compiler, but compilers have become smart, a little bit smarter these days. So this gets vectorized now. Okay. Uh, if you want more details, um, if you go to Bugzilla, there is like whole, um, there's a lot of rant about that, so you can find that one. Um, okay. This is a very simple observation anyone can do, like within a few minutes. And it shows a huge, um, drastic difference in size of data structures for each uh, different containers of st different standard libraries. Vector has the same size for each data. This is for 64 bit. I'm, I'm initializing vector of int, which has nothing. So I, I just call size off on that one. So just trying to show what are the variables, uh, what are the size of variables in the vector data structure, for example. 24, 24, 24, that's fine. As you start going down, you see the differences. For uh, list, Visual Studio has only two pointers. So the size is 16. Uh, for lib standard C++ and lib C++, they have two. Um, so I have not went in, uh, and open the file to see what else is going on. But this is just to show that uh, even for um, well-known STL data structures, there, there's lots of differences. And this is the static differences. The dynamic behavior I've already shown for uh, almost all these data structures. Okay. Yeah. yeah. In some cases, they might, they might be hiding the actual implementation behind the implementation pointer. Mm -hmm. So it would look like it's 16 bytes, but it's actually like 300. Did you check for that? Can you repeat that again? 
uh, in some cases, uh, it's an efficient thing to hide the actual implementation structure behind a pointer to implementation. Yes, that is quite that possible. The price measure is the size of the pointer to implementation, not the actual implementation. Okay, I guess Marshall has more clarification. Yeah, um, in my experience, which is, again, not universal, um, that runs into other problems. I'm not saying people don't do it. It runs into other problems. In particular, it means you can't make the default constructors no accept, which is really useful. If you have to allocate in your default constructor, which Microsoft does in their node-based containers, they can't be no accept. Yeah, so probably that's why they have 16 bytes only. Otherwise, um, other uh, they have a much larger size. Okay, yeah. Um, so I guess this is the yeah final slide, and this is like a rant basically. If you see, um, this is for Intel i7 as well. L1 cache has the latency of four cycles. L2 has 12 cycles. So, and it keeps on uh, increasing. So the idea is, if you have um, if you can recompute the same thing without getting data from memory, essentially what I'm saying is you can do four computations and still have the same performance or better performance if you can avoid a load from even from L1 cache. That is the idea I'm trying to say. Um, someone might, might ask, uh, if they have not got the idea yet, how can you even recompute if I have to load from memory? How is it even possible? So I'll give just one small counter example for like Fibonacci series. Suppose you have an array of already uh, stored Fibonacci elements. In the everything is in L1 cache, everything is good. Still, you incur four cycles. But if you are doing Fibonacci, like you just have to do one addition or one multiplication. Maybe that is much more faster than loading from memory. So there are opportunities where you can recompute the value, um, and probably you can recompute the value instead of loading from memory. Um, I'm not suggesting you should do this uh, like extremely low-level optimizations, but just to keep this in mind. Um, this is only very useful for extremely performance critical loops and probably maybe not useful for uh, any or all of you. But this is a good thing to keep in mind. That you can just recompute if it is possible. Yeah. Um, but isn't it like the new uh, Intel processors like keep a, a, a large set of shadow registers? Does yes. It just, does it just store your registers <coughs> and uh, keep a lot of of uh, computations in those shadow registers, which you can't address at all, but the processor internally keeps track of them? So the, um, the comment here is, um, doesn't the Intel processors, our most modern processor, keep track of the values computed at runtime and reuses them? Um, I don't know, and probably uh, it is not possible to um, reuse the same value, because you can get interrupts and things like that. Um, so. Unless they are extremely crazy, um, it's, I don't think it, it is even possible. And you have to establish many runtime guarantees. Because uh, suppose you compute 2 plus 3 and store it in a register, and there, is an, there came an interrupt or there is a branch misprediction. You have, to co you have to keep track of many paths and uh, uh, establish the invariant state. And um, processors are very, um, they, they don't have enough high-level information to reconstruct the uh, invariants. Okay. Yeah. Any more questions? This is the last slide. So. Thank you.